The entire democratic foreign policy is dedicated to giving Iran as many nuclear weapons as fast as possible, regardless of the consequences. Joe Biden, obviously, Nancy Pelosi have no connection to the problems that their failed policies are causing and they're completely disconnected. Matthew Foldy, thank you so much for joining me on Global Perspectives. It's, ha- it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm a big fan of the show. Thanks, Matthew. So you are a candidate on the Republican line running for Maryland's 6th dis- dis- District in the U.S. House of Representatives. And Matthew, if you win this race, you'll be the youngest member of the U.S. House of Representatives. Tell me first, what's inspiring you to run for this office? One of the big inspirations, I guess, for me is the failures of the octogenarian Democrats who are currently running this country, right? Joe Biden, obviously. Nancy Pelosi have no connection to the problems that their failed policies are causing, and they're completely disconnected from the supply chain crisis, from the price of gas, from the lack of groceries. You know, Pelosi's freezer will always be stocked with Jenny's ice cream, but The rest of us have actual problems, and I think it's about time for a new generation to finally take charge of this country and flip the House and then flip the White House in two years from now as well. Well, Matthew, you certainly are a representative of a new generation. Tell me what you think that your generation cares about at this moment in time. Well, a lot of it is the economy because we are the ones who are going to be paying for the Biden inflation. We're obviously going to have serious problems having Social Security by the time we're 65. So the Biden economy is failing young people. And I think that's one of the top issues. Another issue for my generation is sort of an unwillingness to accept things as the way that they are. I think that a lot of problems that are perceived to be intractable are because There's a lack of creativity on behalf of people who are sometimes a little bit older than myself. So the main thing, though, from talking with people in this district on the trail is the economy. And that's true whether you're my age, whether you're still in high school, whether you're retired, whether you're looking to retire, because we're all feeling it in various different ways. Matthew, you you say a person my age. So how old are you? Tell our audience. I am 25, but... I'm, I'm almost 26. So, you know, I'm, I'm getting uh, I'm getting advanced in age myself. <laughs> well, I'm sure being on the campaign trail has been aging you. Um, and you're you're bringing up some really big topics, inflation in the United States, the, the cost of living going up um, and, and so much uh, so many of the other economic issues that your average American family is facing right now. Higher gas prices. I could go on. What are the um, what are the initiatives and, and what would you do as a member of Congress to address all of these very big challenges that this country faces right now? Yeah, on the on the gas price thing in particular, we need to actually support American energy, of which we have a lot of potential here in Maryland. But we saw when uh, when Putin invaded Ukraine, the Biden administration is so beholden to radical activists that it continued fueling Putin's war machine by buying Russian oil until finally the Biden administration said, all right, we're not going to buy Russian oil anymore. We're going to shift to Venezuelan oil. So the administration is literally funding our enemies rather than creating jobs here in America. That's number one is being able to actually unleash American energy, which will lower gas prices and also create jobs here. And then on the economy, on the inflation side, we need to stop every attempt by this administration to pump trillions of dollars of spending that we don't need, don't want, and can't afford right now. So fortunately, they haven't passed the worst of their ideas. But if we don't flip the house, you know, they're, they are a few votes away from being able to funnel trillions of dollars into the economy that will ultimately turn us into Weimar Germany, where you're going to have the, you know, dollar bills that you would normally use for groceries. It'll be cheaper to use those as wallpaper than to actually afford wallpaper, you know, in Zimbabwe, where you know, one American dollar is the equivalent of millions of Zimbabwean dollars. So the Biden administration is so detached from reality living in this world where you can print money and have no inflationary 
after effects of that. So we need to stop that immediately. And the most effective way to do that for right now until we win the White House is take control of the House and take control of the Senate. Well, Matthew, you know, for our audience, when you mentioned Weimar Germany, that's uh, that's that's kind of very big language. And and maybe some would say it's alarmist. Tell me more what you mean by that when you make that analogy of where the U.S. could be headed if the Biden administration continues with their policies. Well, that's solely an economic analogy, just to any sort of system. And Zimbabwe, in the same way, is a, is a country where your currency is so devalued that, you know, you, I mean, I went to Jewish school here in Maryland and, you know, we had a lesson. We, we learned a lot about Weimar, the Weimar Republic and where that led. But, you know, there was one of the one of the instructions that we had about it was people would literally carry their salary that they received in wheelbarrows because there was they would receive so many dollars, but it would be, you know, one week's salary. And, you know, it would be by the time you cash your salary, it's already devalued and destroyed by inflation. Yeah, and indeed, you know, Matthew, I, I'm actually going to push back on you a bit because when I look at the landscape, um, I know that when you look at these kind of factors, like an economy that um, is about to, I believe, crash crash in a big way, and um, and you see a government that's also trying to censor free speech and, and a lot of different factors that we're looking at, um, I actually think that we could be headed into a Weimar Germany-like state um, in terms of how this all plays out for Jews. What do you think about that? I mean, look, rising anti-Semitism has been a problem in this country. And I, I like, like you, like every Zionist, like every Jew has faced rampant anti-Semitism. Even in America in the 21st century, I was reminiscing uh, earlier this week with my family about when I was about to turn 18. There was a, I think the group is called Answer. It's one, one of the absolutely radical anti-Semitic organizations. And it was during the uh, 2014, Gaza conflict uh, in August 2014, they were descending. Tens of thousands of these protesters were emerging from the holes that they live in to come protest outside the White House. And I thought it would be good for me to wear an IDF shirt and an Israeli flag as a cape and and counter protest. Right. That's fundamentally American. You know, it's their right to, you know, protest and chant every Jew, you know, needs to be murdered. And as I said, well, you know, it's my right also to, to do the opposite. And I didn't realize that earlier in the morning, a lot of my fellow Zionists were escorted out by the police for their safety, right? We, we know that these anti-Israel and anti-Semitic activists basically are unbound by morality and by the law. So the police said, look, you know, you guys are able to be here to the Zionist activists, but it's really not safe for you to be here. I didn't get that memo. So I go there by myself. And I'm walking around and all of a sudden I feel a tightening on my throat and someone is ripping the flag off my neck. And I look, I am surrounded at this point. And so I, she sort of vanished. And then later in the day, I see a photo, I think it was on the, the front page of Drudge, of her setting it on fire in front of the White House. And eventually um, I was walking around, I was filming things. And it's very important to you know, force accountability on these people. They're, they're not smart, though. So I'm filming this guy as he is punching me in the stomach. I, I recorded him doing that. So not not smart. Finally, the police find me and this one Marine and they they get us the hell out of there. So, you know, it is it's sometimes physically dangerous to be a pro-Israel activist, Zionist activist or simply to wear a kippah out in public. So there is huge anti-Semitism. It's obviously not a priority for the Biden administration, the Department of Justice right now is busier investigating parents concerned with school board curricula as domestic terrorists than it is looking at actual anti-Semitic hate crimes that happen in this country. One of the stories that I reported as a journalist Wait, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in for one minute because, because I want to, uh, Matthew, I, I want to ask you a little bit more about that experience. Um, you know, what we're the, the trend lines and the statistics, what they show is young Jews in your generation um, are not typically like you. They're not they're not protesting in favor of Israel. They're not activists. What's your takeaway from that experience and whatever else uh, you may have experienced in terms of I mean, you're what you're describing is a direct anti-Semitic assault on you because you dare to wear an Israeli flag. 
Right. That's normally called victim blaming. Uh, you know, I was wearing an Israeli flag, so I was asking for it in this situation. But look, what I think it shows is the power of community of Kehila in Judaism. And so in the aftermath of when that flag was stripped from my neck and burned in front of the White House, of course, to no consequence for the, in essence, rioters. Uh, my friend from my Jewish school that we had just graduated from, we were all on the cusp of going to college. So still the summer before we went to college, they all came to my house and delivered, I think, five new Israeli flags to me. And so what I think this is sort of true in for, for Jews across history is you need some leaders to say, you know what, look, it, it sucks right now, but we're going to put ourselves out there and then other other people will realize they'll, they'll rally behind that person. And this happened to me when I was in college fighting PDS at U Chicago, which of course passed by a bunch of parliamentary chicanery. But you know, you need a couple of people on the front lines, and then you'll realize that you're not alone. And this is what I say as a Republican from Montgomery County in Maryland, is there are there are literally almost a hundred thousand Republicans here, but you wouldn't think that. So you need a couple of people on the tip of the spear. And that's why I like the the I I like young people like myself and others across the country running because, you know, we're all perceived as being these blue haired, bleeding heart liberals. But in reality, there are an incredible amount of young Republican conservative leaders who are ready to say, yeah, the Biden administration does not speak for me. Nancy Pelosi does not speak for me. So the the aftermath of that attack on me was actually a much stronger Jewish community here. And, you know, people I hadn't talked to since middle school, you know, reached out to me. It was so that was that was a rewarding end of it, but obviously it would have been nice to just be able to counter protest in peace and not, you know, have that happen to me. Matthew, and and so you're talking a bit about your district, Montgomery County. Tell us tell, tell us about your district and the demographics, and do you stand a, a good chance of winning? What does it look like for you in your race? The way I think about this district is it stretches from Montgomery County and the, the northern part of Montgomery County to Frederick County, to Washington, Allegheny, and Garrett. And these are very disparate communities. But one thing that unites every single person in this district is that we have a congressman in David Trone, the Democratic incumbent, who could not care less about us. And one of the things that I exposed as a reporter was the nationwide continuation of not working by elected Democrats, both in D.C. in Congress, where their offices are closed, where their offices, even if they're open, they ban handshaking, they have max capacity, like an AOC's office of two people per office. Meanwhile, all of them are at the Met Gala. They're all at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. And so coronavirus doesn't exist in those places, but it does in Democrats' offices where they're supposed to be doing jobs. Now, David Trone, my opponent, is the worst in the country. He doesn't even live in this district. He lives about 25 minutes from the Capitol, and he misses about a quarter of the votes. If you acted this way in a business, you would be fired. Every single one of his taxpayer funded constituent offices in this district has been closed for two years. I visited all of them and you see mail literally piling up, gathering dust. So whether you live in Garrett County, whether you live in Montgomery County, David Trump does not care about you. And that was one of the things I was exposing as a reporter was that the Democrats who are in office right now want to live like this forever. And they think that senior citizens Rural Americans can just do government by Zoom. You know, if they have a problem, oh, all right, just fire up the old smartphone and connect with us via Zoom for a 10 minute meeting. Well, that's not that's not sufficient. That's not a representative government of the entire people. So the district is fairly large. But one thing that we all have in common is we have a, a Democratic representative who simply doesn't care about us. Matthew, you know, it's interesting what you're saying about um, about not working uh, under the premise of COVID and, and working remotely, because what I can share is, uh, you know, towards my end of my term in the State Department, um, when most of the State Department went remote, we saw federal employees across the agencies you know, supposedly working from home, but people simply had stopped working. And because of the strength of the unions, there was just no accountability. And uh, and we've seen Americans suffer the consequences of that in the, the services that Americans just haven't been get, getting from our federal agencies. So I really understand and resonate what you're talking about. And uh, and it's certainly, you know, if, if America can get back to work, I don't know why our electeds and federal uh, employees can't. So this is an important issue, and I hope people really understand it. 
Matthew, you mentioned that you uncovered this as a reporter for the Washington Free Beacon. Tell me about your experience there. And do you think it has um, somehow prepared you for time in office? I think the two ways that being a journalist has prepared me for both as a candidate and as a congressman are one, as reporters, you are there to hear people out. You are there to, in some cases, uplift voices. So in a lot of cases, I did that talking with parents, teachers, administrators, and school boards and school school uh, districts around the country, hearing what's going on, you know, the insanity. So one on the one side, it's listening to your community, which David Trone completely fails to do, right? You literally cannot reach this guy. And it's a joke because tonight he's hosting Joe Biden for an in-person fundraiser at his uh, mega mansion in Potomac outside of the district. So it's safe for David Trone to host the president, but it's not safe for David Trone to do his job. And then the other side of being a reporter is doing the actual investigative journalism that I reported on extensively at the Free Beacon. And then I've been on a lot of people on the campaign trail have said, oh, we recognize you from Tucker Carlson. We were door knocking yesterday and one voter said, oh, I recognize you from Newsmax. Soon we're going to have voters recognizing me from your show. And so the, it's the investigative side. It's the oversight side because Democrats in Congress are literally out to lunch, right? They're not working. And even if they were, obviously, they have no interest in holding the Biden administration accountable. Matthew, we spoke a bit about um, about the economy and energy production in the United States. What are the other issue areas that you want to work on once you get into Congress and that you believe your constituents care about? Well, it wouldn't be your podcast if we didn't talk about foreign policy. And I think especially with the Middle East, my sort of unified theory of democratic foreign policy is since 2015, every time you wonder why are they doing this? Why, why are we funding Russian oil as Biden is calling Putin a war criminal? It is, to no surprise of anyone listening, the entire democratic foreign policy is dedicated to giving Iran as many nuclear weapons as fast as possible, regardless of the consequences. So in my estimation, the reason why we were funding Russian oil as Putin was invading another country was because simultaneously, Putin's guy in Vienna was negotiating on behalf of the United States a new deal to give Iran nuclear weapons, which is almost certainly illegal because we were told, and Ted Cruz did a great job of exposing this, that the Biden administration, well, they're not negotiating a new Iran deal. This is an entirely new Iran deal. So their quest to give Iran nuclear weapons is an ideological one driven by, in large part, increased anti-Semitism in their party and drastically increased outright anti-Israel hostility within the party. So now I'm not going to say that's the top issue on voters' minds when I'm talking to them, but I do think that in Congress, that's something that is just an absolute no-brainer for someone who's running in a district with as many Jews as we have here in Montgomery and Frederick. There's even Jews in Allegheny County. So that is, for me, it's always front of mind for me as someone who went to Jewish school and preschool through 12th grade. Um, you know, how about Israel is something that was instilled in me from, from literally my birth. And so that is front of mind for me. Other issues, though, that are on voters' minds in this district is crime and public safety and uh, education as well, because especially in Montgomery County and in Frederick County, a lot of people moved here because of how good our public schools were. Like when I was in high school, I went to a Jewish school, but our high schools were some of the best in the country. And we're seeing those slip to places where they should not. Our schools in Montgomery County are sort of the uh, petri dish for horrible policy that takes... uh, that takes rise elsewhere in the country. So whether it's things like abolishing final exams, we did that years ago, whether it's things like uh, pushing for as much equity training as possible, and perhaps most concerningly, whether it's forcibly removing school resource officers from schools, which then caused the first ever school shooting in county history. And as I'm going on people's doors and I say, I ask open-endedly, what is your top issue? A lot of voters though say everything because there are so many problems going on in this country. Biden has no interest in solving any of them because he's created all of them. And David Trone, of course, has no interest in solving any of them because he'll never hear from a single constituent. He's too busy running his multi-billion dollar company from the halls of Congress, which is wildly unethical uh, to actually care about what his constituents want to say. But you could write him a $100,000 check to the Joe Biden you know, campaign fund and you could go to David Trone's house tonight And then you could tell him where no one will be wearing a mask. You could tell him then what's on your mind. Matthew, uh, I I hear the passion in your voice, and I can tell how much you authentically care about these issues facing our country and your your hopeful constituents, your neighbors right now. 
Matthew, uh, let me ask you our final question because I know our time is up soon. Do you think that you represent your generation? When I listen to you, I have hope. You know, I hope that uh, that, that if you do, you know, that, that it would mean it would mean that this country can turn from a direction that I think is really quite dangerous for us right now. Do you think you represent your generation? Look, I'm running to represent Maryland's sixth congressional district, and I want to represent my generation, my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation. And to me, I think this is this fight, this election is about everyone's generations in the present, but it's also about the future because the people who are running the country have no stake in in the future ahead. So I want to represent all generations. And you know, to, to the point that I can show that young Republicans exist, I'm happy to do that. But at the end of the day, this is about the sixth district, not random Generation Z, you know, Republicans around the country. But look, I'm happy to be a role model for them as much as possible as well. Well, I think your point about, you know, who has the most at stake and who's going to pay for these policies into the, into the into their old age. It's definitely you and your generation. And uh, I'm really just so pleased to have had to have you on Global Perspectives and uh, we'll wish you luck in your race. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you.